Hi, I'm Lenny from Protocols.io. And um, I won't be talking too much about Protocols.io itself, but rather the numbers behind trying to get a new platform up and going. So I'll do a very quick introduction um, on what Protocols.io was started to do, why we exist, and uh, then be very honest about what that adoption was like and what it took to um, get to the point where we are today and what are the different things that we tried, most of which did not uh, turn out to be effective, and what are the things that did help us to survive and uh, get some momentum. So the thing we um, got started trying to address is nicely captured in this tweet from a scientist who says, I'm looking for protocol in 97 paper, is described in 96, finds 96 paper, is described in 87, finds 87 paper, paywall. Um, this is a PDF, so you don't see the animated GIF where the person throws the laptop out of the window. It's <laughs> rather frustrating experience. Uh, here's a physicist with a similar idea. Devices were fabricated as previously described, previously described, previously described. The original references devices were fabricated with conventional methods, right? <laughs> Great. Um, so th it's a little bit tricky, and the last thing I'll do on this is my favorite blog post on this, um, actually from a professor, uh, Timothy Poisson, who is at Montreal, University of Montreal, and he has a blog post which is, our method sections are essentially this, right? How to draw the owl, and he says, um, we learn about methods by reading papers. And the method section of any given paper is often, to put it mildly, terse. Um, traditional method section would be something like, we draw the owl on 60.2 GSM white paper of the A4 dimension using 3H and 6B graphite pencils, Cumbria UK. We did so by looking at owls and drawing what we saw on paper. This protocol yielded one drawn owl. Mm -hmm. Uh, really excellent summary of what a common uh, method section of a research paper is like. And so uh, with Protocols.io, we, in 2012, with my co-founders, um, became obsessed with trying to make this better. Right? So the mission is very simple. Long before you're publishing, to make it easier to detail what exactly you've done, share it with your colleagues, make it easy to share those details when you're publishing, and for me personally, as important uh, as both of these is also to give you an easy way to keep these up to date and share the optimizations and corrections long after you've published. So my own personal experience um, as a postdoc at MIT was the first year and a half went into fixing just this one step of a previously published protocol. It took me a year and a half. Slight modification, it's not a new technique, right? It's a correction of something that's previously published, so that means I get no credit for it. And everybody else using this method is either getting completely misleading results or has to spend a year or two rediscovering what I know and um, what I would love to share, but there is no GitHub for science methods for me to easily do so, right? It's not a new paper. So, uh, as I said, 2012, we had the idea we're not the first ones to have an idea of creating a protocol knowledge base repository and trying to change the, um, the culture. But uh, I'm lucky to have a great co-founder. We think we can do this uh, at the right time. And um, we build an open access platform, free to read, free to publish. I'm not going to give you a demo, but it really is a gorgeous interface. As I said, I'm very lucky with my co-founder who really takes user experience seriously. So wonderful interface. It's free for scientists. Um, these are not static PDFs. Um, these are dynamic and interactive methods. So here's a screenshot. I'm really not doing justice to the platform. Play with it. Take a look at it, protocols.io. Wonderful. Um, you can run the methods. They have structure. On the right-hand side over here, you can click on any step and have a conversation with the author. So here's an example. Thank you for sharing, but I have a question. The question goes to everybody who's using the protocol, including the author. You have a reply right there. You're building public FAQ. So there's a lot of value for, from this. My favorite example of what this uh, enables is uh, from this conversation on Twitter. 
uh, where a scientist in Chile is asking, does anybody have a protocol for getting RNA out of neuron cultures? This scientist from UCSF says, oh, you should try this particular technique called trisal extraction. And then she says, there's a few of them on protocols IO. Here's one that should work for you. And what I love about this example is if you look at this particular protocol, it actually turns out to be from a Giga Science paper on parasites of stickleback fish. It has nothing to do with neuron cultures. Right? Um, so the fact that there is a protocol in this paper, that there is a link to protocols IO to the details, it doesn't just make this paper more reproducible and more rigorous. It creates a knowledge base and allows other people then to find in the common Wikipedia-like resource to find these methods, adapt them for their own application. So there's a lot of benefit to the scientists, to the publishers, as I said, uh, free to use. And, and um, we also have mobile apps, iOS and Android. So th this is heavenly, right? And you'd think it would just take off. And no, it won't. <laughs> And the reason it won't is uh, because of what's uh, commonly referred to in Silicon Valley, at least, as the cold start problem. So it turns out that uh, when you launch something like this, it's a social platform. It's kind of like launching a new journal. Uh, nobody is going to be submitting until everybody's submitting. Um, so it's hard. And uh, here's a blog post on uh, social products. How do you go viral? And it says, the problem is, until you have strong baseline of engagement, it's nearly impossible to have a metrics-oriented discussion on growth and virality. So you have to get there first before you can talk to the next step. Um, another blog post on this, without brand recognition on your side, you're basically launching to an empty room. And that's exactly what we saw when we launched in 2014, so the curve looks nice because we're all automatically drawn to what's on the right-hand side. So here, um, this is monthly, not cumulative. This is monthly number of protocols that are now going into protocols I.O. and how many people, how many scientists are putting them in. So there's about almost 1,000 protocols monthly that are now added to the platform from hundreds of scientists. It looks wonderful, but I want us to focus on this part, right? And that's exactly what the cold start problem is. And the really crazy part is we knew this would be the case long before we launched Protocols I.O. So in 2012, when they came up with the idea, it's like, well, this is a crowdsourced resource where we are expecting the scientists, the crowd, to contribute the knowledge. It'll be a desert unless we have a crowd. We have to somehow create a crowd before we launch. And so, Starting in 2012, um, towards the middle of 2012, instead of just building protocols I.O., we had all these ideas for how to create the crowd and then give them protocols I.O. So we build free iOS and Android tools to get sort of trust from the science community, give them something they can just use without having to first take time and put in protocols. Um, we build a literature recommendation service. We build all these free apps. Literature recommendation service, you load in the papers you read, it tells you new ones that come out. Wonderful tool. No one knows it exists. We're back to that same cold start <laughs> problem. So now we are trying to promote this literature recommendation service, and we build the ability to tell the story behind your paper. Erin knows all about it. It was one of the first essays there, so that it gives us content and people learn, can learn that we've built this literature recommendation service. And we're doing these like layers by layers, more and more things to promote what is actually not Protocols I.O., but another thing that a year from now is hopefully going to help us get Protocols I.O. off the ground. Uh, we build a blogging platform. I'm not going to go through all of the things. At the very end, uh, we basically run out of money before we've built Protocols I.O. We have three months left, and at that point, it's like, all right, um, none of this is working. Let's just build Protocols I.O. And, and the last sort of Hail Mary is we do a Kickstarter. Uh, there's a lot of excitement around that. There's a number of people in this room who helped us pull off this Kickstarter and amplified it on social media with blog posts. So it happens. And after all of this year of free tools and clever ideas, um, all these different things that we've done, 
We launch protocols I.O., we have the Kickstarter, and there's nothing, right? Um, so I'm not going to go through all of the things that we tried that failed. This is just uh, a sample, a subset of them. Um, there's a supplementary slide. I've uploaded this to Zenodo. There's a supplementary slide on most of the things that we've tried. It's a pretty big slide um, that didn't work, so you can open that up and take a look. Um, this is an important thing. In the early days, I talked to the co-founder of Mendeley, the CEO, Victor Henning, at that point. Um, and my question to him was, should we just shut down? Is this something that no, nobody needs because no one is using it? And his answer was, no, you're doing great. You just have wrong expectations for how these things take off. You think there is such a thing as going viral. That does not happen. Like, but we already have like a 1,000 people through the Kickstarter that signed up. Why are they not sharing protocols? Why is there no word of mouth? He says, until you have hundreds of thousands of people using you, the word of mouth doesn't do anything. Right? So now you have to get to those hundreds of thousands. And um, as I said, the cold start is a general problem. It is particularly brutal for science communication platforms. Right? And it's because scientists are some of the busiest, most overwhelmed people on the planet. They're some of the most skeptical people. Right? So the second they hear about a new tool, they're asking, what if it goes bankrupt? Are they selling my emails? Right? What's the business model? I've seen so many of these things come and go. It probably won't be around tomorrow. And they're probably right. Uh, we had like five or six instances where we nearly died in the first three years of that freezing phase. Right? Um, librarians are busy. They're not going to suddenly promote you on day one as a tiny startup. Um, all the partners you want to connect to are also afraid that you will fail. So it's a really, for most new efforts, this is a very hard phase. Um, and what we learned very quickly is that even when you tell people that this exists, the scientist, she's not going to suddenly come in and start sharing. The first thing the scientist will do is come to Protocols I.O. and look for their favorite method. And if it's not there, we'll say, oh, that's a great initiative. I'll check back in a year. <laughs> so you suddenly realize, and this is what F1000 uh, founder Vitek Trucks told us, you need content. If you don't have content, you're going nowhere, no matter how beautiful your user interface is, and regardless of whether it's free and mobile. Um, and so here are some of the things that did work. And not Kickstarter. You, what, what I want to point out with the Kickstarter is we launch, there is a transient bump, and then it goes right back down, the number of people creating to zero, right? So. That's, that's the launch of Protocols I.O. And then we realized, OK, we'll need methods. We'll need partners. No one knows that we exist. Genetic Society of America, the journal Genetics, was the first one to add us to author guidelines in 2015. And it's kind of hard to see in this graph, but that helped um, <laughs> tiny bit. Right? Three months later, Giga Science was amazing also added us to author guidelines. And that was it for like a year and a half in terms of journal partnerships. Everyone else we went to was like, oh, you won't be around. Uh, we're not going to bother, right? <laughs> um, realizing we need content, we started going to reagent vendors, companies that sell chemicals to scientists, because they have protocols that work. Otherwise, people are not buying the reagents. This bump that you see over here is New England Biolabs. Uh, giving us all of their protocols to cross-post and then linking to us from their highly trafficked website. This was like this period of time, uh, there are no new partnerships because this is me manually entering 100 protocols from New England Biolabs step by step. Um, that's the content seeding that you have to do, right? So these are the things you have to go through in the beginning. And then NEB links to us, we have a press release. And then there is a long period of being exactly, there is no virality, right? There's more people who know about us. There are more people who are starting to add protocols. But this is still tiny. And we are light years away from that point where you have hundreds of thousands of registered scientists who are actively talking to each other. And it just goes on its own. And so there's New England Biolabs. 
The next bump over here was the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation supporting us, starting to work with us and encouraging their grantees to start sharing protocols, right? And again, it helps us go up, but it's not something that then leads to the hockey stick that everybody is hoping for. Public Library of Science, April of 2017, added us to all of the author guidelines. That was the first big publisher of the genetics and giga science, the first big publisher, and that is the part that sort of switched the red light to green for other publishers. And from that point, we went to something like 400 plus journals. Hindawi just added us to all of the, uh, Katrina's over there, um, to all of the journals, um, eLive, so a lot more partners came on board. This is still, out of 27,000 biomedical journals, these 400 are a tiny sliver, but at least now we are in author guidelines. And what you're starting to see here is the early adopters were submitting papers to journals. They're seeing us in author guidelines. Um, they put their detailed protocol in protocols IO. When the paper is published, people are reading the paper and starting to come to protocols IO, discover that it exists. Um, so a lot of what you're seeing here is all of these partnerships, right? All of these early supporters without whom 95% probability that Protocols IO would not exist today. Chan Zuckerberg being another funder that is now asking the grantees to add protocols and they're also supporting us. Um, but these first years, right, are absolutely brutal. And even this curve that we're seeing, this is thanks to the partnerships that we have. This is not this magic viral growth that people are thinking is coming from word of mouth. Word of mouth is adding to this. And now that we have thousands of public protocols, people are, half of our traffic is from Google. People are landing on protocols IO, discovering us from the papers. But this is not some magic, you've built it and they will come type of an effect. Um, and so after launch, right, what we learned is what, what is absolutely critical for platforms like this is finding the early partners like Genetics and Giga Science and PLOS uh, that can make all the difference, getting the content, finding vendors like New England Biolabs that are thinking about more than just their product, they're thinking about the community and trying to innovate. Social media does help. Um, but it takes a long time. It's not like you create a Twitter account and suddenly everybody knows uh, about you. As I said, seeding the content that all the scientists need, right? It's kind of like when you launch a journal, you already need papers there. So this is very important. I can talk more to people what it means, uh, user interviews and feedback, but the interface itself, of course, can make a huge difference in the adoption and the social part. Are people really having conversations? If they don't know that you can comment on the protocols, they're not going to be commenting. So that has to be, uh, through the interface, very clear. And of course, funders, now the librarians are very important as they add us to guidelines, and not guidelines, but the uh, resource pages and talk to scientists about us. Early adopters. The ambassador program that we started two years ago, the early adopters, the scientists who connect with the mission, they make a huge difference. So all the uh, new initiatives that I talk to, I really encourage them to um, have an ambassador program. And as I said, the attention to the user interface. And then the other part is, I don't have time to go into it, but you want micro communities, so we've created groups where viral ecologists can come together, human uh, oncology biologists can come together, but you want people talking to each other in their community, not just in a huge space where no one can find the content and you don't know exactly who you're asking and who you're collaborating and communicating with um, on the protocols. And so before I take questions, just the key things are to have proper expectations, we nearly died because we had the wrong expectations for how it takes off, right? So if you're trying to evaluate, did we build something that people really need and will use, it is really important to know what is that good adoption, right? Um, what is your expectation for how quickly people come to the platform? 
don't do what we did with we'll build a crowd with a million different tools and then we'll give them protocols IO. You will build a crowd on those million different tools and those are the users of those tools, not of protocols IO. So then later when you tell them about protocols IO, they'll say, that's nice, but I signed up for this thing, I, <laughs> not for protocols IO. Look for partners and the thing that has been driving me crazy is every single time in these first three years when someone tells me, oh, well, you know, startups need to fail fast. Um, people just repeat it over and over. It's like a mantra in Silicon Valley. And that's really easy to do failing fast, right? You just shut down. It's very fast. Um, you can do it before you launch. It's succeeding and getting to this part that takes a very long time and is very hard. Um, so forget the fail fast, and I get all the credit, but I'm not the one who's building this. There is an incredible team of people uh, behind all of the mobile, behind uh, Protocols IO and the entire product uh, that exists, and all of the partners on the bottom, many of whom I already mentioned um, in that curve. And with this, I'll stop and take questions. Hi, so thanks for that. It's, it's really valuable. I, I'm, I'm reminded of you know, the, the meetings that we had in Amsterdam, um, the first, or the second Beyond the PDF meeting, and were all these people demonstrating these fabulous tools and, and what were we doing to support them. So um, I'm really interested in that phase, you know, three years of really hard growth. What kinds of funding systems would have made your life easier? Are we, are we delivering the right kind of financing, the right kind of funding mechanisms that actually help not just you survive to the point where you might succeed, but that actually really help you succeed at the right kind of scale um, through, that, through that three, four years of hard graft? Yeah. So um, it's a great question. It's not just the funding. It's one of the key things I want to try to get across here is a, a lesson for people who are trying to launch initiatives like this, but B, the role that funders, publishers, librarians can play in supporting new tools, right? Because without you guys, I guarantee you these things fail. And we completely randomly, it's just sheer luck that we came across the Moore Foundation. They were, they had an RFA out for a method-oriented collaborative platform that they've been working on with the community since 2011. And it's total random dumb luck that we found out that they have this RFA and co-applied with a professor who was invited to apply for it. Um, we would have been dead without it, but it's very hard to get this kind of funding. Um, we cobbled together pennies from angel investors and then small grant for more foundation, another small grant from them, grant from CZI, but um, CZI, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, didn't exist two years ago, right? And chances are, if we hadn't met them two years ago when they got started, um, there's a good probability that even with PLOS and all of these partnerships, we would have run out of money and we would have said, I, you know, there is nothing to look forward to. We should shut down and go get jobs because our credit cards are maxed out and our savings are gone, right? Um, so there is a lot of opportunity. Uh, there is no good mechanism for supporting efforts like this um, that I can really think of. When people ask me for advice, it's just, it's brutal um, and it's luck. So whatever the community can do to try to support, it, there's so many tools, there's so many innovative people, but if we don't support them, right, and it's not just the funding, like I said, it's these early people who see something and like genetics and giga science and plus that take a look and say, we should support this in the early days. Without it, it is nearly impossible. Question over here. <clears throat> Hi, uh, Gunter Eisenbach. I actually launched a platform researchprotocols.org two years before you launched yours. And it's still around and it's actually quite successful. But even though we don't have the numbers you have, I think your numbers are fantastic. Uh, we don't get that number of protocols, but we are 
successful in the sense that we can pay our bills because the business model is different. The author pays and we carefully copy edit protocols, we submit it to PubMed. So it's a, it's a different model than that. So we are not dependent on having these kind of numbers. We are, like, we are happy with the numbers of players uh, or, or authors who submit protocols because we charge on a per protocol basis. So my question is, what, what is actually your business model? And did it ever occur to you that maybe it's not the, the numbers which are wrong, maybe it's your, your business model? Yeah, oh, absolutely. thank you, because I do have a business model slide. It's important to say what it is. Um, and it's very simple. It's just like GitHub. It's free for academics. It's free for anybody who's sharing publicly. But if you want private groups and private collaboration, then you have to pay. So we know that the business model works, right? It worked for GitHub. Uh, we have private groups that pay. And then we aggregate and anonymize uh, the information around the use of the protocols and reagents inside them. Um, and that is so we don't sell author emails. There's no private information we give out. But knowing which protocols are going up, which reagents are being used, um, that is very valuable to funders, to reagent vendors. Um, there, there's, so there is a business model. This is how, uh, for me, I come from my Kaizen's lab. I believe in open access. For me, it's very important that this is a free resource. There's a reason Wikipedia is free. There is a reason why Facebook is free. If you want a social network, um, I, I think it's a different model than charging to publish. Um, I don't think you can get something like GitHub or Wikipedia to work by charging the author. So for us, it was very important to make sure that this is free to read and free to publish. But I completely agree that there are other ways of doing it, other business models that wouldn't rely on venture capital or grant funding um, and the years of pain, necessarily. Lenny, thank you so much. That was great. And uh, join me in thanking Lenny one last time for Thank you all.